wanted to do a quick video about some interesting um, packaging technology used in DC to DC converters. Now what prompted this was I saw this in the uh, Farnell catalogue. This is a Murata isolated DC to DC converter. But where's the inductor? Well, um, we'll get back to that in a little while and um, take a look at a few others first. Now DC DC has been around for ages, they're used wherever you want to you know, convert one DC voltage to another. Probably the most common is where you want to take a high input voltage and reduce it down to a low voltage to run something lo local, local to the device. Yeah, for exactly the same reasons that mains electricity is sent at high voltage, the um, supplying at high voltage means that you get much less current, so less loss over cabling or PCB tracks and so on. These are sort of fairly typical of low end DC DCs, these have been around for like 20-30 years. Sort of fairly simple uh, through hole packages, sort of dill and uh, silver versions in a variety of powers from sort of half a watt up to a few watts. Um, these aren't anything sort of particularly special but they're just a pretty much a jelly bean part. They're made by quite a few different companies. And if we look at what's inside these, it's basically a toroidal inductor, um, a few transistors. Um, the toroidal inductor yeah, looks sort of fairly randomly wound but it's, it's fairly sort of bog standard technology. As you go up the power scale, the next sort of ones that you find are very commonly things like this. This is um, in an industry standard package known as an eighth brick. I think this is derived from um, sort of bigger parts of, for example, that represents a full brick and you can get other you know, smaller converters in half, quarter, eighth and sixteenth brick. But um, this seems to be one of the most, most common ones. Th th these are quite often designed for 48 volt input. Um, these are very commonly used in telecoms applications. And the input range can be anything between sort of 22 and about 70 odd volts, but they're, they're generally d designed around a nominal 48 volt in. And for example, this one puts out um, 5 volts at 24 amps, so you can get sort of a pretty decent power density. Um, this one's got a, uh, a metal plate for clamping to a heat sink, but they, they pretty more commonly come with just a, a bare board like this, and they're designed to be run in a fan called airflow inside of a um, piece of fan called equipment. And I've occasionally used these in installations where we've got quite a large number of LEDs that need powering, uh, particularly over a distance, over a long cable. Because yeah, things like addressable LED tape that you only want a 5 volt supply, but you can't really run that over any serious length of cable without getting a serious voltage drop. I've actually got an upcoming job I'm uh, starting to work on that's using um, this white addressable tape. It's going to be about over 400 metres of this, about 100 odd boxes with converters like this in it, powered from um, 48 volts that are going to go over a sort about 20 metre cable run, so you really need to yeah, boost up to a fairly high voltage. The reason that you tend to use 48 volts rather than mains, um, obviously one is safety, 48 volts is generally regarded as non-hazardous, but also because you, you know with mains you've got generally a much larger device, you've got electrolytic smoothing caps, um, so these are much more compact. And in fact you can actually get these, a TDK Lambda do uh, a device in this size that can put out over 300 watts, which is pretty incredible. The interesting tech that these things use is these planar inductors. Basically what they are is, you can see the PCB itself is quite thick, um, and the, the, the inductor windings are actually PCB tracks, um, and then they, they, they just sort of fit these ferrite over the, just over those PCB tracks to form the inductor so it means you don't have any interconnected it's, it's very small and compact to get a yes, small size these days uh, con converters will tend to run at quite a high frequency anything from 500 kilohertz to a few megahertz so obviously all the switching nodes need to get really small to avoid the effects of stray inductance and stray capacitance but also the and, the, and that, that's one reason why you might use a package DC to DC rather than sort of just using some chips and implementing it on the board because for example this, this type of thing you, you, you need a board that's got multiple layers so if the only thing that needs a lot of layers is your DC DC it doesn't make a lot of sense to you know, have a your you know, your board with everything else on it and integrate this onto the body it, it's often a lot more sensible just to use a, a drop-in ready-made part but obviously there's also quite a lot of engineering design work that goes into getting these efficient getting the noise within sensible limits so um, using a ready packaged DC to DC just as provides a simple drop-in solution to uh, minimise the amount of design work. And you do very occasionally see these planar inductors in other equipment, but say there's quite a lot of engineering involved, so it's not that common. I actually found them in this, this bit of gear. Um, there's actually one here that's unpopulated, so you might just be able to see there's a sort of one big fat track on uh, one side of the PCB, and the other tracks are actually on the inner layers. Um, you may just be able to make those out on the inner layers. But um, so for products where you've got enough PCB layers to do it, yeah, this is quite a, uh, quite a nice solution. But it's also fairly robust because on big inductors, yeah, they tend to be made 
yeah, they're, they're sort of quite heavy, and if they if they surface mount it, they they can be vulnerable to snapping off because of the weight if the unit's subject to shock. So, yeah, as well as being sort of fairly compact and um, low cost, they're also yeah, extremely robust. As well, if you've got yeah, a really big chunky inductor to do it like this, means that yeah, it's not going to ever fall off the PCB. Right, on to some sort of slightly more modern uh, devices. These are some quite interesting ones. These are um, from Linear Technology. This is an LTM8025. And um, these have got some really impressive specs. This one will take up to 36 volts in and give you up to 3 amps out at um, from about, I think, 0.8 to 36, 36 volts. Um, these aren't completely integrated. These just need some external capacitors. So they, this is the, the minimum you need to run them. It's just an input and output capacitor and there's a resistor that sets the output voltage and the um, operating frequency. And these these come in this sort of land grid array package, which um, is actually pretty straightforward to use with a standard like stencil. And, uh, I've even done these with um, manual applied solder paste and reflow process because the pad pitch is only it's about one point I think these one point two seven millimeters, so uh, the pitch is fairly sensible and these will reflow quite quite nicely. Um, this is a slightly smaller version. This is the LTM eight hundred two three, which is a two amp output. And if we look at the X-ray of these, we can see that we've got you know, a lot of the packages, the internal inductor, we've got a couple of devices, sort of die bonded devices, there's probably a main control IC and probably an output switching device or possibly a diode, I'm not sure what that other device is, and a few um, passives in there. But so this, this gives a nice sort of very compact package. Um, these are quite expensive but if you needed like a really sort of small DC DC with minimal design effort the, these are quite a nice little solution. These aren't isolated. Uh, generally if you look at specs they tend to call things like this POL or point of load converters, i.e. you know it's a converter which is close to the point where you need the voltage. These are obviously the sort of thing you use if you're if you've got like a very low voltage processor core. Um, you, you know you really have to have the converter ne next next door to it. The uh, you know, all these converters provide isolation. Again, that's very handy if you've got a long cable run to avoid any issues from ground loops and so on. And these small ones, are, you know, these are very popular for things like um, isolated RS-485 interfaces or an isolated A to D front end to provide you a little, bit, a little bit of isolated power and then the data would go over an opto isolator or a magnetic coupler. These would be used to provide the power over the isolation barrier. And so these are non-isolated and so for a lot of applications you may want, may well not need the isolation and that obviously makes it quite a little lot smaller because it's just a simple single inductor. One of the problems with rolling your own isolated converter of course whereas a standard non-isolated converter it's just a, yeah, it's a simple inductor so there's a very wide choice of off-the-shelf parts but a, um, an isolated device needs you know, a two-winding transformer and there are far far it's much harder to find an off-the-shelf part to do that um, if you're trying to roll your own, so that's where it becomes much easier to uh, just use an off-the-shelf part. And in cases where the isolation is part of a safety barrier, you know, a lot of these come with all sorts of safety approvals, UL approvals and so on, and they'll guarantee them up to whatever isolation voltage the data sheet says, or you can certainly get them up to like 2 or 3 kV isolation voltage. So again, that's something that's very difficult to roll your own if you're not making you know, a high enough quantity to cover the uh, development costs. Right, just coming back to this, this is a um, Murata part that I noticed, it's just quite interesting, they're, yeah, they're, they're a fairly cheap isolated converter, this is a 5 volt in, 5 volt out, I think it's about 1 watt or so. Um, and what they've done is they've basically taken the concept of the planar inductor and turned it inside out. So instead of having windings on the PCB and sort of wrapping the ferrite around that, they've actually buried a ferrite inside the PCB stack. This is a, uh, like a toroidal ferrite. And if you look at the bottom, you can just about see sort of windings going across with vias. So they've basically, you know, wound a coil via PCB tracks and vias around the toroid. Again, if we keep, if we look at the X-ray, you can see this a lot more clearly. So yeah, a very thick PCB with these uh, very long vias. It looks like it looks like there's something like about 12 layers that are visible, but I I don't know whether this would actually be made as as um, that many layers, or we're just seeing layers of the actual you know, material that uh, is laid up to uh, provide the final assembly. But um, I'd be interested to know a bit more about the actual um, manufacturing process, because obviously they'd have to make you know do some of the PCB layers, then machine out the cavity for the inductor, drop the inductor in, and then sort of put the other layers on, compress it all, then do the through plating, then obviously the components can just go on as a standard surface mount reflow process. 
and the electronics are pretty straightforward this is the primary side there's just two transistors here I'm guessing that's probably a Royer type um, circuit and the, uh, there's a couple of diodes and what I'm guessing is probably a regulator on the um, the output stage but I thought that's just a really nice solution to you know, not having to wind a coil by actually building it onto the PCB and obviously you know, like an umpteen layer PCB is not cheap but these things are so small you know, they're going to get a good few hundred out of a single panel so the, the cost of doing that you know, is probably more more cost effective than um, using a wire wound um, inductor so I just thought that was a really neat little piece of um, packaging well, I think we can see most of the structure in the x-ray but I think we uh, we need to crack this open to uh, see if we can see any more, more interesting details than this So we can, see, we can see the inductor here, but as as expected, there's really nothing else in here. So you can see the, um, the vias through here. There isn't really any detailing on these uh, these inner layers. It's really just the top and the bottom layer, and then the rest is just a spacer. Not quite sure why they actually have this gap. I don't know if it's maybe to if there's any outgassing issues with the core, or even something really st simple, just to make you know so they can do a visual inspection to make sure they remember to actually put the core in in the uh, manufacturing process. So that's just been uh, routed out to take it. In fact, now we've got this bottom off. You can actually see the uh, the tracks a little bit more clearly. They're just. Uh, so just a bunch of radial tracks connecting to the uh, linking the two sets of wires for the primary and secondary windings. Now this is probably the most extreme example I've seen of interesting packaging. This is now this is probably the most extreme example of um, interesting DC DC packaging I've seen. Um, this is the uh, a nano module from Texas Instruments. This is the uh, LMZ twenty one seven hundred. Um, this will do six hundred and fifty milliamps out at 0.9 to 6 volts out uh, and the input voltage can be up to 17 and basically yeah, the component on the top that for scale um, that's about three and a half millimeters across and that's a 1210 inductor on the top and they've actually managed somehow to bury the die inside yeah the die is actually embedded in the PCB um, like the linear tech modules, this just needs external a couple of external caps and a couple of resistors. So your overall converter size is probably about twice the PCB area of this. Is basically two. I think the minimum is two eight oh two oh eight oh five capacitors and um, a few passives to set the output voltage. But um, this is just you know, an amazing bit of uh, packing efficiency. To get about three watts out from a package like this is just incredible, and it's. Um, the footprint is just a DFN with a um, thermal pad, so that yeah, that's entirely solvable using a standard paste refi process. But um, that is just um, I really must try and think up an interesting application to use use these for because they're just so neat. You could these you could probably actually use these for driving um, high power LEDs because um, the feedback and input voltage is 0.8 of a volt. So if you um, used a instead of using voltage feedback, if you put a current sensing resistor and use this in, in the sort of current feedback mode. Yeah, this would probably be quite nice for driving a sort of between a one and three volt LED if you wanted to do, do some really nice, nice small package. Maybe package the converter and the LED on the same aluminium PCB. I'll have to have a think about something interesting to do with that, but uh, that's just incredible. Well, there's no point in x raying this with the inductor in it because it's not going to penetrate the inductor, so I'll take the inductor off and um, x ray it and then maybe look at perhaps splitting it just to see how they've managed to package that um, chip inside the uh, PCB. So I've never seen that done before. Now, unfortunately, we can't really see anything of the silicon on the x ray because silicon is very transparent to x ray. So, uh, we'll have to try see if we can split this and see how they've actually packaged it. So, I'm going to have to do this under the magnifier. I can't really do this under the camera very easily. I'm going to struggle to sort of split this because it's so small. You know, we've got some silicon die here, but it's really not clear how they've managed to embed it. I can only assume it's the sort of contact bumps on the die that they put onto the one layer of the PCB and then sort of laminate over the top of it. But it's uh, 
It's a somewhat more involved process than that uh, Murata device. I don't think you can really see a great deal, but it's, um, it's like certainly an interesting piece of tech and not a packaging method that you're likely to use for a home project anytime soon. But yeah, the fact is it does produce these quite nice devices that are available at uh, stupidly small sizes at fairly sensible prices.